Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Sea Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Gorowski. I'll be your host for today. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation to classrooms all over North America. And very excited to uh, jump once again to Toronto, Ontario, uh, where each month we hang out a few times with the Royal, or sorry, the Royal, <laughs> the Ripley's Aquarium of Canada, as I said, located in Toronto, Ontario. We're going to be joined by Danielle and David today. And today we're going to meet the zebra sharks. So they're, we're probably going to see a little bit of feeding, but also we're going to see them undergo some tactile desensitization training. So the goal of this training is to reduce uh, the stress of being handled for things like veterinary procedures. But Danielle and uh, David are going to be able to tell us a lot more about that. So let me turn on Danielle's microphone and see how everyone's doing at the aquarium today. All right. Hi, Joe. Hi, everyone. And this is Dave over here. Let's give a big wave. Ah, hi, Dave. You hear me all right? We've got you loud and clear. Oh, perfect. So Dave will be coming in the water in just a few moments to uh, feed our wonderful sharks. Uh, the sharks that we're looking at today are called zebra sharks, and they are these yellow ones. There's one right here. Uh, there's only two, and the other one is a little bit farther back, which is kind of behind the bubbles, but Dave's going to turn the bubbles off so you can see them a little bit clearer. Uh, zebra sharks, although they have a name suggesting that they are stripy, uh, they get that name when they are young. When they're adults, they actually lose the stripes, so they just have this cool speckled pattern, which is why in Australia they are also known as leopard sharks. So uh, these beautiful sharks are the largest ones in this tank here, but not the largest ones at our aquarium, but they do have a very large tail to body size. So as you can see, they do swim very gracefully through the water. Dave is getting ready to go in the water right here. And the sharks definitely know that he's in there. Uh, they can sense his pulse while they swim through the water. Uh, so they know when he's in the water, that means food time. He's got this big bucket of food right over here. He's gonna go and feed our wonderful animals. Yeah, so uh, we have two zebra sharks. They are both girls. Uh, their names are Biggie and Drew. And uh, Drew just swam away and Biggie's the one that's really close to us right now. And I finally figured out how to tell them apart. So I'm very proud of. Uh, they're uh, not that hard to tell apart because they're only two, but most often with a pattern shark, you're looking for patterns. But uh, on these two, if you want to try, uh, Drew here has a little imperfection on her fin, and Biggie doesn't. So that's how I tell them apart. Uh, but they're both very healthy, uh, and they're as big as they are going to get. And they start out pretty small compared to this. And this is a type of egg-laying shark, so they are uh, well, these two probably won't because there's only girls in our tank, but they usually end up laying eggs. And uh, zebra sharks actually uh, can uh, reproduce very easily in a captive environment. So uh, the two that we have here are probably also from the captive breeding program, so we don't have to take them from the wild. Same with our bamboo sharks, which is one right down here. Um, we have lots of them being born at our aquarium, and hopefully we'll get a chance to see those later on during our hangout. So Dave's just getting the food prepped so that he knows exactly what type of food he's feeding all of our animals. So uh, we have some capelin, which is a little fish hanging on top of the basket. And the sharks can smell it, as you can see. And we have some salmon over here on the lid. And the sharks are able to sense food very, very easily. So they have electroreception, which is a lot of pores on the underside of their faces, which allows them to sense uh, weak electrical impulses in the water which is what they're sensing on Dave as he moves. And then they can also have an immense sense of smell. Their best sense is actually their sense of smell, and they can smell for a very long range. So Dave is actually going to be hand feeding our sharks. So he is wearing gloves because, yes, they do have teeth, um, but no, they're not going to bite him. Uh, they have crushing plate teeth instead of uh, the pointy serrated ones like we have. So they're meant to crush shelled food. So uh, they'll actually suck the food in. You might not have heard it, because uh, my microphone's a little farther away, but they will make a nice suction noise if they're close to the surface. So what Dave is getting the sharks used to is, as Dave said, I'm sorry, as Joe said, was tactile desensitization, which pretty much means get them used to being touched and handled enough so that they are not shocked by being flipped over. When they're flipped over, they actually go into a state of tonic immobility so that we can actually do things like blood draws on them and give them checkups so that they're a little bit more comfortable with us. Because we don't want these animals to be uh, uncomfortable when they're in their home here at the aquarium. 
So uh, they will get them more and more used to him as he's in the water, and he will hopefully be flipping Drew over uh, so that we can see her belly. And she's still getting more and more comfortable with Dave as the feed goes on. And uh, this also means that when we want to give our sharks a checkup, Dave just has to go in the water, and they'll come right to him because they are positively reinforced by food. So that is pretty much like every time that you do something good at home, you might get an allowance. And uh, you feel good about that, and that means you're more likely to do something good at home. So uh, we're doing the same thing here, but sharks don't care about money, and we do it with food. They very, very much care about food. So other than the zebra sharks in here, uh, there are white spotted bamboo sharks, which is a little brown one. There's one right there next to Dave. Uh, there's some white tip reef sharks, some black tip reef sharks, two wabagons, and one epaulet. And the epaulet shark is my absolute favorite type of shark. And I don't know if he's going to come say hi, but he's white with these two giant black spots on his body. And as you can see, uh, these sharks are not afraid of Dave. They are coming around just to say hi, because they are very curious when it comes to food. And only the sharks that he is trying to feed are coming close to him. The little White spotted bamboo sharks will come and sniff out the food because they smell it, but the food is much too large for their very tiny, tiny mouth. So they will swim away when they find that out. And the other sharks don't get fed in this manner. They actually don't get fed while Dave is in the water, so they will not be coming around to try to get food that way. It's uncomfortable for them because they know that they get fed by a uh, grabbing pole, kind of like an extend arm. So uh, as you can see, Dave here. Uh, he actually goes by Shark Dave at the aquarium because he is not at all afraid of sharks. And he loves working with them. That's why he works in the only tank at the aquarium with only sharks in it. And uh, he absolutely loves working with them. And they're not scary. Dave has been working with them for a while now. And uh, although you might think of sharks as really good predators, which they are, and they do, most of them have sharp teeth, they are not out to get us humans. They are a very good predator. Oh, man. I think it's gonna happen. There we go. Now you can see what they look like upside down. And now he's going to positively reinforce them upside down by feeding them a little bit of food. So uh, this is Drew and she's big this over just so that we can make her comfortable with being upside down so that we can do some draws on her. And as you can see, Dave is very friendly with his shark. Giving her a little kiss on her belly. Uh, so sharks are really not as dangerous as you would think. Um, there are more things out there much more dangerous than sharks, like vending machines are really a common cause of uh, fatalities compared to sharks. You really have to get those candy bars out. You can wait, wait until those machines fixed. Uh, and also, uh, sharks, are they'll try to stay on their own in the wild. So if you encounter one in the wild, they'll probably think of you as a weird non-fish and swim away or continue hiding. In the case of these sharks, the zebra sharks, they'll probably continue hiding. Although they are swimming around a lot right now, uh, they're nocturnal most of the time, and uh, they also spend a lot of time staying still during the day. They are not a shark that has to continuously swim in order to breathe, so uh, they're not going to do that. Oh, there's the epaulette shark. You see the one with the big black spot? That is my absolute favorite shark. That is in this tank. Uh, it's really cool. They can actually walk on their fins. Which is amazing. We only have one at the aquarium, so it's really rare to get to see them. So uh, zebra sharks here, uh, plus a whole bunch of other sharks, have this uh, hole called a spiracle, which is close to their eye, and that allows them to pump water in over their gills, allowing them to breathe properly. So they can stay stationary, so they're not moving, and still breathing. Most other sharks actually have to continuously swim in order to breathe properly. Uh, so. The continuous swimming motion allows them to breathe, and usually larger sharks are in that category. So um, our bright whites would be in that category, although we don't have any here at the aquarium. Uh, and uh, fin tiger sharks are kind of in that category. They can do a couple things, uh, but they do like to swim for long periods of time to help them breathe. But here, uh, these sharks, although they seem very active, are pretty lazy compared to some of the other ones. And uh, if they want to, they can just rest on the bottom and be completely fine. Now, these sharks are actually protected around the Australia area. 
However, not in most of the other areas where they naturally occur, which is in the Indo-Pacific Ocean and a little bit more coastal. So they're going to live near the shoreline more than anywhere else. However, uh, the easiest way to help these animals out in the wild is to actually eat sustainably. So you can choose resources where uh, we're not negatively impacting their uh, natural habitat and uh, where they're actually catching the food that we are actually going to eat instead of extra stuff that we end up throwing back and not using as food. So that includes turtles and dolphins, other sharks and other fish. And we don't ever want to do that. So uh, there are two different websites that you can go to. There are many more out there, but the two that we advertise all the time at the aquarium, uh, the one for Canada is called OceanWise, and that was started at the Vancouver Aquarium. And the one for the United States is called Sea Choice, and that's spelled S-E-A. And you can download those apps on your phone and then look for sustainable options at your restaurants and grocery stores. And they usually come with just a tiny logo and it's the easiest thing to look for. And as you can see, um, our shark has, Drew is getting a little bit more used to being flipped over. Um, Piggy really isn't as comfortable with being flipped, so you will not see her being flipped during our session today. And maybe we can look at some eggs. Hey Dave, you think you can show us some eggs? Hey. So this is a zebra shark egg. Uh, so our zebra sharks, as I said, are both females. They are not going to have any babies, but they still release their eggs, just like how a chicken would normally release their eggs even if they don't have a male with them. He's gonna still continue to feed at the same time. However, we do have some babies at our aquarium in sharks, which is why we never know how many sharks we have at our aquarium because they keep having babies. And that's from the white spotted bamboo sharks, which have tinier eggs. And uh, there are some little tiny babies over here, which I can show you if I move over. And they are just down here. You see how tiny they are? And that's just in a tiny laundry, it's just in a laundry basket. Uh, and there's an egg case in there. And if I move the phone over a little bit, you can see the difference in size of the egg case. The one on the left is of a zebra shark. And the one on the right is for a white spotted bamboo shark, which are really closely related animals. However, they do have different sized eggs because the animals, as you can see, are very differently sized when they are adults. The white spotted bamboo sharks, the little ones, that's as big as they get. The zebra sharks over here, that's as large as they are going to get. Uh, other than the sharks in here, uh, we do have 13 species in total in our aquarium, two of which are just in their egg stage. Uh, and then when they are born, uh, they go off to our holding facility, which we have in Buffalo. And then they'll go off to hopefully our aquarium, but we're not exactly certain where their final destination will be. We've just turned over that exhibit to have different types of eggs. And our white spotted bamboo sharks, when they get older, they actually go off to other uh, facilities, that, which includes research facilities, so we can learn more about these animals. Uh, now, if you look at how Dave is handling the animals, he is very comfortable with them. Uh, he told me once that when you touch a shark, uh, they actually feel a lot like sandpaper. I've never touched a large shark like this, but the smaller ones, they do feel a lot like sandpaper, but they're pretty smooth, fine grit sandpaper. But a larger shark, uh, like these ones, are going to feel a lot more rough because they do have larger scales on their body, which if you look at all of these sharks swimming, they create no ripples while they swim. They swim incredibly smoothly through the water. And you'll notice that as long as they don't break the surface of the water, they will not create ripples. So they can easily sneak up on their food, which makes them excellent predators. They can always catch their food. All right, Joe, I think we're ready for some questions. All right. Well, first of all, we'll just start with another big thank you to, to you, Danielle, and David as well. We always love these hangouts, and you guys are so great with the animals and the information that you do share with us. So once again, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. All right, so we've got a great group of classrooms joining us from different spots uh, around North America. So let's start turning on some mics and let's say hi to some of our classrooms. So classrooms, when I introduce uh, your groups, um, feel free to be nice and loud, say hi. We're going to start with one question from each class and then we'll open it up for a little bit of time at the end. So let's go um, to Virginia first. We have some grade three classrooms, three grade three classrooms at Dryden Elementary with Mrs. Williams, Ms. Wade, and Mrs. Polly. So let me turn your microphone on. And we'll see how everyone's doing today. How are we doing, Virginia? Kevin, hi. Say hi. hi. All, right. All right. Let's have someone come up with a question. All right. Can you come here to the camera so you can see? Yeah. 
Do zebra sharks have scales? That was a great question. I'll repeat it back so everyone can hear. Uh, the question was, do zebra sharks have scales? And the answer is yes, but they're not the same type of scales that you think of that a typical fish has. So zebra sharks have uh, more of a bony type scale, so it's derived a little bit differently. So uh, typical fish, uh, if you brush it backwards, you, the scales are flaky and they'll brush up and it'll seem like little flakes of skin coming up. But on a shark, they are actually hard and they're made from dentin. And dentin is like what's in our teeth, but our teeth are a little bit strong and they have enamel. So uh, they actually stick out slightly from the shark's body. So when the shark swims through the water, they create no ripples, as I said before. That makes them absolutely silent predators, which is amazing. Uh, the scales are actually really tightly located on a shark. So it means that other animals, like barnacles, will not attach to them like they do to whales and other animals out there. Uh, and they will also have a less likely chance of getting any uh, parasites because there's not as many open spaces between their scales. And it is a really good thing for a shark to have this many scales because if they didn't, they'd be more like a stingray, where a stingray is a slimy animal to account for their lack of scales. Well, they're less scales than a shark has. The stingrays do still have scales. But uh, sharks are not slimy animals at all because of the vast amount of scales they do have on their body. And if you're wondering what they're called, their name is from Latin and it's called dermal denticles. And that means skin teeth in Latin. All right, great question. Let's meet another classroom now. So this time, we're going to jump a little bit away from Virginia. We're going to go to uh, Calgary, Alberta, with a grade four three class uh, with Mrs. Pearson. Your microphone's on. How's everyone doing in Calgary? All right, let's grab a question. Um, were they back here? from the ocean or was there for Could you repeat that for me? Um, were they born there or were they brought from the ocean? Oh, uh, were they born here or were they from the ocean? Uh, and the actual answer to that is neither. Um, they were not born at our aquarium because these sharks are older than our aquarium. So our aquarium is only four years old, so we're still very young. Uh, however, they are not from the wild either. Uh, they, Because they are not from the North America area, it is really hard for us to get these type of animals from the wild, uh, just because there's a lot of transportation involved in that. But there are some aquariums in the United States that naturally are breeding zebra sharks, and that's how we got ours. They were given to us um, as adults, and I'm not exactly certain which aquarium they came from. But all of the aquariums in North America constantly communicate on which animals are reproducing uh, and so that we do not overpopulate of any type of animal and also so that uh, we can share all of the animals between the different aquariums in North America. Uh, we're all very friendly with each other even though it is a few countries involved in the sharing process. We have trucks that will move them between the different areas. Our aquarium is very unique in that we are actually a split company between the United States and Canada. So uh, Ripley Entertainment started out as an American company and a few years back was bought out by a Canadian company. So we bridge the border really easily so we can share all of our animals. All right, so just a quick reminder to any classrooms who are watching live on YouTube, let us know who you are uh, in the YouTube chat sidebar and send in a question if you want. We'll try and work uh, a couple in. So now we're gonna jump to uh, another classroom. We're gonna go to uh, Mrs. Stevenson's class. They're joining us from Garden City in Kansas. They're grade five students. Your microphone is on and we'd love to steal a question. How long do zebra sharks live for? Oh, that was a great question. How long do zebra sharks live for? Uh, they usually live for about 30-ish years. 35, yeah, 30, 35. Uh, we don't really know how long they live in the wild, uh, which is common for most animals that live in aquariums because we know how long they're going to live here. If they were born at one, they have a birthday. Um, however, in the wild, sharks don't age like most other fish do, so we can't easily tell how old they are. Um, the easiest way is to give them a little tag like a uh, dog or cat has, like your pet, and then you can scan them every time that you see them again. However, uh, you will never know when they were born. You can just estimate based on their size. And once they get to full grown, they usually don't grow that much bigger. So uh, 
these ones are not that old. They're probably around eight to ten years old. Um, but uh, they, 30 years is actually a good chunk of time for a shark. Most sharks only live for about that long. Oh. All right. We're going to switch gears now. We're going to head to another classroom. This time we're going um, to Quebec, and we're going to join in with Mrs. Patterson's class. They're grade five sixes. And your microphone is on. You go for a question. Your question? Okay, well, Avery, you can ask your question then. How deep does the water have to be for them to live in it? Oh, that's a great question. How deep does the water have to be for them to live in it? And the answer is it doesn't really have to be that deep. Uh, so reef sharks uh, live in a reef system, so they have to live in the more shallower waters because if they are a little bit too deep, uh, they don't like too much darkness and they don't have as much hiding spot. So they actually only live to about um, 12 meters deep, like it's not that deep. But uh, here at the aquarium, uh, they easily come into the shallow waters. You can see Dave, Dave's pretty tall. There's about a foot and a half of water in the shallow area, and they are completely okay with being in there. But they do have to uh, be in water in order to survive. The couple species of sharks that can actually walk on land for short periods of time, in case they get trapped when the tide is low, and that's the white spotted bamboo sharks and the epaulette shark. Uh, and then they'll usually crawl back into, land, uh, into the water right afterward. But they can hold their breath. Uh, the larger zebra sharks will spend more time underwater and will not usually get trapped on land. All right, we're heading back to Kansas. Yeah. This time we're going to the editor's class. class. Uh, grade, four uh, grade four students at Grabber Elementary. Grabber elementary question. question. What do you like about your job? Could you repeat that? Can you repeat that? What do you like about your job? Oh, what do I like about my job? Oh, what do I like about my job? <laughs> I like doing this sort of stuff. So uh, getting it, the ability to inform the leaders of tomorrow about things they can do to make sure that our world becomes a better place. And also showing them the really cool facts about all of the animals that I love. So uh, I don't really like animals that live on land. Uh, but I do really love the ones that live underwater, and that is probably my favorite part of my job, is to share what I know to uh, those who don't always appreciate the animals to live underwater, to make them appreciate them more. Dave, what's your favorite part of your job? Feeding sharks. His favorite part of his job is feeding the sharks. All right, so let's grab a question from uh, our YouTube viewers. So this is a JKSK classroom from Pembroke, Ontario. And they're wondering, can the zebra sharks jump out of the water? I'm going to ask that Dave that question. Hey, Dave, can the zebra sharks jump out of the water? Um, no, especially not in a tank like this. They could, if it was a small boat or something possible, um, but they don't really have much of a jumping ability. They're certainly not a fast enough shark to get us to Do you guys hear that? Or you want me to repeat it? Uh, yeah, we could hear it a little bit, but if you can filter it back to us. Yeah. So uh, the sharks in the exhibit we have here can't really jump out. As you can see, we do have tall walls, but their bodies are not really meant to jump out of the water. As you can see, they're pretty slow moving sharks. And usually the ones with the forked tails are way better at jumping out of the water than these ones. And they don't have a reason to jump out of the water either. So uh, some animals will jump out of the water just because that's what they're trying to do is escape from a predator or uh, to swim a little bit faster, or to catch some prey, like a great white shark jumping out of the water to catch a uh, sea otter. All right, we're going to jump to another classroom now. We're going to visit uh, Mrs. Ed Rosny's group. They're joining us, uh, let's see, grade five students in Bristol, in the United States. So I need two things from you. You tell me what state Bristol is in, and then we'd love to get a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Connecticut, excellent. Can we get that one a little bit louder? What do you do on the sharks when you're doing the 
right, I got the what do you do part, but not the rest. Oh, did you hear that, Danielle? What do you do with the sharks? Yeah. You clean the tank. Oh, what do we do when the sharks when they clean the tank? Uh, we just leave the sharks. They remain inside of the tank. Uh, and then uh, Dave will go in and scrub all the surfaces. The fake coral gets really algae, so we have to scrub it clean. Okay. Danielle, um, on our end, we've lost camera. I don't know if it's the signal or maybe it was accidentally switched off on your end. Um, but we can hear you nice and loud and clear. We just can't see uh, the sharks anymore. Oops, looks like we've lost uh, Danielle for a moment, um, but don't worry too much. She should pop back pretty quickly. And there we go, she's back already. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. That's okay, we <laughs> seem to have lost camera. I'm not sure why. I Can might you have tell if it's turned that off, actually. Off on yeah. your end, I'll try and look on my end, but okay. now that you're back in it, the Hangout, you're- It's telling me that there's a problem with the camera on my end, so. We'll figure okay. that out later. <laughs> let's not worry about it too much right now. We got a really good uh, view to start, but uh, let's talk to Mrs. Caracas's class. They're at Roberta Bondar Public School, and they're joining us from, I believe it's Brampton. Let me double check my list. Yep, Brampton, Ontario. Um, if you guys, I should be able to reach your microphone. It's just off my screen. I'm going to try. Or I might need your teacher to do it for me. If you can turn the microphone on, it's just off of my control screen. I can't reach you guys. We have so many classrooms today. But if you're not able to unmute, that's okay because you sent the question to me online. And they're wondering about their status. Are they close to extinction? Are they endangered? Oh, that's a great question. So they are vulnerable in all places except for Australia where they're protected and they're least concerned. So uh, okay, they're so doing pretty well in the wild around Australia, but not so well other places. Well, that's some good evidence for protected waters is if the area where they're being protected, they're doing okay, but elsewhere they're not. So that's some really good evidence for conservation. All right, let me just take a quick look and see if we have anything from our online classes. And I don't see anything. So. What I'll do, because we still have a few more minutes, is if any of the other classrooms have another question, if you guys want to send someone up to the camera to wave, and I'll make sure that I pick a couple more classrooms where I see someone right up at the camera. So I see lots of hands. Let's see. Who's going to get to the camera first? Safely. Don't go tripping over your classmates. Oh, there we go. So we're going to Mrs. Stevens' class. There's a question coming in. Can you try that a little bit louder? What are zebra shark's favorite food? What are zebra shark's favorite food? Yep. All right, perfect. No Dave's thinking. They'll pretty much eat anything. Um, I know that a lot of the other sharks really do prefer the shellfish that we feed them, like squid and shrimp. But I think that they care more about Dave being in the water than what they eat. They like being um, interacted with when they're fed. All right, great question. Let's jump to Virginia now with our grade three classrooms. Your microphone's on. All right. How small can tiger shark sharks eat? How small can tiger sharks get? Good question. How small? What's the smallest? Sounds like it. I think he's wondering maybe how small tiger sharks are when they're born. Um, I'm not precisely sure, but uh, in general, a lot of the live bearing sharks, which is not this type, these are egg layers, but the uh, live bearing sharks, they usually start out between a meter and two meters long just to get a good head start on the world uh, because they're a constantly swimming animal and they have to get really, really big. So sharks usually do grow pretty fast in order to get to their full size. And then uh, the the rest of it is just making sure they have a great start in life. So um, they're usually at around a meter, which cuts down on the amount of natural predators they'll have when they're young. So they have a better chance of reaching adulthood. 
Okay, let's jump over to Quebec again, Mrs. Patterson's class. Your microphone's on. How cold is the water in the aquarium? <laughs> How cold is the water in the aquarium? So each of our tanks is different. Uh, this one is probably around 22 degrees, like most of our other tropical tanks. Yeah, All right. 22. That's 22 degrees Celsius. I do not know what that means at Fahrenheit, so you're going to have to look that up. But uh, 75, 75. <laughs> Dave was telling me. Uh, so this is uh, one of the typical temperature for most of our tropical and uh, tropical aquariums, with the exception of our one tank that uh, is really large and has lots of fake coral in it, and it's 25, 26 degrees Celsius. All right, let's go to Mrs. at Rosny's class. I can see someone right up at the camera. <laughs> Um, since sharks frequently breed, is it ever hard to take care of their tanks and the sharks? I get that do sharks frequently breed, breed but uh, the taking care part I can't remember. Yeah, so he's wondering if, if they frequently breed, does that make them harder to take care of? Um, no, actually, it, it just depends. So if they frequently breed and you don't want them to, you just separate them by gender. That's why we only have female zebra sharks, just to control it. Um, and taking care of the babies is not as big of a deal as you think. Uh, yes, they do have a lower chance of survival just because they are young. However, uh, they're pretty easy to feed because they eat the same stuff the adults do. So it's just smaller. So we have to cut it smaller than what we would normally feed the adults. But they're not like us. They're born with their full set of teeth, ready to embark on the world, try to survive on their own. They don't need to have any parental care. so. We can take them out and put them in a different area for our animals to survive all on their own. All right, and we'll take one more question. I think I see someone standing in Mrs. Pearson's class uh, in Calgary. So let me turn your microphone on and you can uh, wrap up our Q&A period. Which part of the ocean do they live in? Which part of the ocean do they live in? So uh, sharks are found everywhere in the world. Uh, there's a few species that are found around Canada in the cold water. But the zebra sharks, they live in the Indo-Pacific Ocean and around Australia. So that's south of China and around Australia area uh, and around south of India as well. And they live more close to the shore than in the open ocean because they like hiding spots. All right. Well, first of all, once again, uh, Danielle and David, thank you so much for another great hangout. We always love meeting the zebra sharks, and we're excited next week to meet the seahorses again. That's always a ton of fun. Um, classrooms, thank you so much for hanging out and joining in. You guys, as uh, always, had some incredible and great questions. And to all our classrooms joining us from the United States, happy Thanksgiving coming up this week. I hope you guys have a great holiday and lots and lots and lots of turkey. And um, Danielle, I'm glad... Uh, we had a great signal today, right up until maybe partway through the Q&A, we lost the camera feed. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it was really nice and clear, and we got a really good look at the sharks today. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad it worked out for most of it. All right, well, thank David for us. And uh, I'm going to turn the camera, or sorry, the cameras, the microphones on, let the classroom say goodbye and thank you. Then we'll sign off from today's Hangout. So boys and girls, I'm going to turn the microphones on nice and loud. A big goodbye and thank you to Danielle and David for joining us today. Here we go. All right. An excellent job as always. So uh, Danielle and David, thank you again and enjoy the day at the aquarium. Uh, thank you, Joe. All right. We look forward to seeing you guys again next week.